What is up, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Breathe and Air podcast, where everyday action meets extraordinary mindset. I am pumped today for y'all to hear about our guest. He is the drummer for Chelsea Cutler. He's played at places like Lollapalooza and the Red Rocks. He has his own artist management company and development company, Baron Owl and Pack Records. And he also has a sick newsletter that I'm going to give you all the links to later called The Weekly Chop, where he talks about a whole bunch of crazy stuff and great mindset stuff that really meshes with what Breathing Air is about. So Gavin Chops, welcome to Breathing Air, brother. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. You know, it's a pleasure to be on this podcast. And uh, thanks for that really great introduction, you know, like really boosting my ego. <laughs> hey, you you know, you are, you're a man of many talents and, and your story is really interesting. Music is one of my passions and one of the things that I've always, always loved and found a really deep connection with. So getting artists on the show and just being able to listen to your mindset and the way that things go is super, it's super intriguing for me. And I know it is for other people too. Yeah. My mindset is pretty much everything um, when it comes to anything you want to do in life. And actually right now in this period of my life, I've, I'm in, I'm in like, I call it like a growth phase. Yeah. Um, I feel like I'm always in some kind of a growth phase, but the one I'm in right now is extremely like inner internal, extremely internal growth and something I'm really trying to focus on and, and be aware of. And I always know that whatever is on my mind is what is going to kind of identify and lead that growth. And there's something called the Bader-Meinhof phenomenon. Have you ever heard of that? I haven't. And it's pretty much, it, it talks about how selective attention and confirmation bias. And so pretty much what you have going on in your mind is what you're going to be thinking about most of the time. And it's what is going to guide you through life. Yeah. Um, so I try and keep things I'm focused on top of mind by writing it down in the morning, you know, thinking about it, writing down at night. So my selective attention is always focused on that or grows over time. Right. Kind of like the law of attraction thing, right? Exactly. Same, that same kind of concept. And I see your, your uh, idea board, your chart board back there, you, <laughs> a huge proponent for writing things down. Were you always like that or is that something that you kind of came into later? Um, I say I've been writing for a long time, but mostly like free writing stuff when I was a kid, just because I don't know why, like my parents or my grandmas would buy me journals and I would just write. But now it's more, um, there's more of a purpose to my writing. I do free write. I give myself time for free writing, but Mm -hmm. I have a like um, so something I do every day in the morning and every night. Yeah. I feel like as an artist and a creator and uh, someone who's, you know, whose mind works towards that musical talented creation kind of vibe, it's super important, but I think it's very practical for other people too to put their thoughts down. And I always say it's like putting, it's the first step to putting something out into the universe, right? That goes back to that concept you were talking about, or law of attraction, whatever you want to call it. It's constantly, you know, putting good thoughts out there, putting, you know, putting good vibes out there and, and then doing the action on the back end to, you know, help that manifest. But tell me, a little, yeah, for sure. So tell me a little bit about you, like your background, where you're from, family. 100%. Um, I grew up in a small beautiful little town in Connecticut um, called Weston and it's just a very woodsy town very small town very like there's it's definitely a more afflu affluent town yeah so it was really it was really really pretty and you know you don't realize that when you're when you're when you're born somewhere like that like how lucky you are mm -hmm. you know and it's, it's something I've been really grateful for and you know I never I never take it for granted, you know, I've never taken for granted where I grew up and how it affected me like growing up in life. Um, but I always was into music. I was always uh, very um, on the creative side of things. 
I was not very good at making friends growing up. I actually had like very, like I was depressed you know, as like a third grader. And my, I, I had to go to like this, this class after school and they would ask me like what emotion I was feeling and make me take an arrow and like move it to like a face that signified like my emotions. Cause I wasn't like displaying emotions correctly. Yeah. Um, but my parents sent me to a really amazing creative school called the Mead School in Stanford, Connecticut, where I was able to just focus on drumming, on writing music, on art, and focusing a lot on the self. So from fourth to eighth grade, I was really able to grow into who I am and embrace everything about me creatively. And by the time I graduated there and went back to public high school in ninth grade, I really understood who I was and I wasn't afraid to be weird or like out of the box. And it was an amazing experience, which I contribute a lot of who I am um, in life pretty much, which is, yeah. Yeah. It makes me speechless sometimes to be honest. You get that that's such a cool idea, honestly. And I mean, it, you said it was from fourth through eighth grade, fourth to eighth grade. Yeah. Wow. I mean, I feel like so many people could benefit from a system like that. And I yeah. think a lot about back now, the, the school system, public education, how flawed it is as far as, you know, we could talk about a lot of different things, but you know, being able to express your creativity and not being put in a box at a young age, which, you know, at a young age, we kind of are, you know, sh- shuttled in one direction or the other, as far as like arithmetic and this, this, that, you know, science. And well, what if, what if that isn't something, you know, that you are interested in, or what if you do have specific problems or issues that, you know, may not be touched on at, at a, you know, public school. And I think that's a, I think it's a great idea. And obviously it really helped, you know, boost your creativity and help you find your passion, which is what you're doing now. hundred percent. You know, I picked up the drums at this school. I learned how to record music at this school. My, my little eighth grade project to graduate was to write, record and perform a song and like play all the parts in the song, write an essay about the song and perform to my whole entire school and that that was my graduation project and that that really just started started me off into this creative way of thinking about life um and really crafting you know the next years of my life and doing things how i want to do them doing things on my own and it's definitely a little bit of stubbornness to just you know not be a conformist i think that the school kind of distilled that in me as well but it also made me feel like i was capable of achieving the exact like vision i had in my mind for what life is supposed to be yeah and a huge kudos to your parents too for allowing you to explore that side of your brain at such a young age too because Mm -hmm. i feel like so many times i hear people talk about their passions or certain things that they want to go for, but mom wants you to be a lawyer. Dad wants you to be a car salesman or whatever it may be. There's kind of like, whether the parents know they're doing it or not, there's times where they're pushing their kids in one way. And obviously at a young age, or even when you get older, you know, you want to make your parents proud. You, you, you look up to your parents. So, I mean, it's huge to that your parents like saw that in you and then let you grow and kind of flourish into that. And I mean, obviously that attributes a lot to, to what you do now and, and how you do it with such passion. hundred percent. I mean, my, my parents, you know, they still, I wanted to like do music full time, but you know, it's my parents didn't think that was like a feasible way to, to like make a living. So they, I still like, you know, I went to college, got my degree in business and, I, I like tried to get jobs at, um, you know, different finance, different finance jobs and uh. management jobs. And like, I just, I couldn't do it. It just wasn't for me. And, um, my parents, they weren't like happy with me for a little bit because I tried starting a record label in the basement. <laughs> I like tried starting this management company and my parents are not in business. They're both, um, like, um, organic, like, 
health nu- nutritionists and chiropractors and they don't they didn't really know much about like the business world and the music world and they were like what are you doing like what are you like when are you going to get like a job and but now now they're really proud of me now they see like where everything's led yeah but i think you know my parents definitely enabled me to to do that and even though they they still wanted me to pursue a safe route and be in the business world or get like a law degree. They, I think they knew inside that I was never going to do that. So, (laughs) yeah, I mean, it's just, I feel like it's the conservative nature of a parent to look after and want a safe route for their kid, you know? Yeah to an extent, it's not that they're trying to hold you back, but they'll always have those like protective measures just because you know, that you're their kid, but, but that's a, that's super cool. So organic farmer, uh, tell me a little bit about that. My mom growing up was all organic. She was before the wave. I always say she was before the wave of like these health trends that we're seeing now, but, um, tell me a little bit about that. Like, how was that growing up? So they weren't farmers. They're they're just into like homeopathic um, medicine and just r- super organic food. You know, they they've been on the gluten free wave exactly since like the '90s. You know, my my grandparents on my mom's side were also in in health in the health field. So it's just been in my family for a really long time, and it it's also been a blessing. You know, I hated it as a kid. I hated not being able to eat all like the the cookies and the ice cream that all my friends were eating. But I was, you know, now in, in my late twenties, I'm so grateful for the knowledge that they gave me because I just know how to, you know, treat my body and give my body the nutrients that makes me have energy. And the way I say it is it gives me the proper awareness to see the world without being like cloudy. You know, I see the world extremely clear because I give my body the proper nutrients it needs to, to be active all day. Yeah. I, it's so funny you say that because it's such a parallel to how I felt too whenever I was younger. All my friends would come over and be like, oh, you don't have any like Coke or any chips or anything. I'm like, uh, no, we got some kombucha. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, this is nasty. I'm like, mom, you got to get something like no one wants to come over and eat snacks at my house, you know, but now I agree. It's like, wow, I'm so thankful that I have that knowledge base. And, and even being in that and being instilled at a young age, you do have to look at food as energy, like as an energy source. And I'm always, always preaching body, mind, and spirit and how those three, those three pillars work together. And if one's lacking, you're going to feel it. There's going to be an imbalance. And, and I think that oftentimes, you know, people eat for pleasure and because it's because it tastes good or it makes them feel good. And that's all fine. And well, I'm not saying you have to be so strict that it's just like, oh, but you also have to realize that like what you eat and how you eat and what you put in your body, and how much water you drink, like that all works together with how you feel your energy levels. Like you said, the way you see things, the way you see the world. And then even like the ethical stuff that comes along with it. I mean, there's a lot of unethical ways that, you know farming is being done and that, you know, uh, when it comes to meat and things like that and I eat meat and I'm a proponent for it, but at the same time, it's like, look, you got to look at these certain things that are you okay with what's going on here? One and two is that's not healthy for you to be putting in your body after it's been treated like that. So it's, it's, it is a blessing now to definitely look back and, and see that thing. I, uh, I noticed on some of your pictures, like you look like you've been hitting the gym, you know, eating clean <laughs> and, and obviously swimming is probably very, I mean, it's a physical activity, especially when, you know, you're really going at it. So what are some things that you do physically wise along with, you know, eating a clean diet? Um, I, I work out, you know, I, I view it as a meditation you know, I view it as a very physical meditation. So it's, it's very mental for me. Um, and I think for a lot of people, people have trouble motivating themselves to work out because they view it as this, you're doing it for to make your body look aesthetically pleasing for other people. And it's not really motivating, you know, at least not for me, for me, it's more of like for mental clarity and also to, 
if I wanted to go hike a mountain tomorrow, like at a really high speed, I want to be able to just be able to do that. I don't want my body to ever limit me. So I do a lot of running and a lot of um, like body weight circuits. Yeah. I kind of switch between there. I'll run from my office in Flatiron all the way to Bushwick, which is like seven miles. And I'll do that like with my backpack, with my computer and all my stuff in it. You know, I'll do that one day. Then the other days I'll, I'll go to just the park and just do like different kinds of push ups and pull ups and all that kind of fun stuff. And then drumming itself is a workout. And when, especially on tour, the shows are, you know, our shows are an hour and a half long. So I'm literally, I play really hard. I play as, as hard as I can. Cause that's, that's how I express myself on the drums. So yeah. I, I give my everything and I, I'm like, I break heads, I break sticks break so many sticks it's a problem but it's a real cardio workout like i i come off no one wants to hug me ever because i'm just dripping sweat yeah how many how many sets of sticks do you usually bring up there um i've actually it's been less because i've been experimenting with stick types and i used to use a little bit of a lighter stick and i'd use i'll go through like eight or nine sticks a, a show but now I actually switched to these Travis Barker, who's like a, he's like a really yeah. famous drummer. He has his own stick and it's pretty like thick. And the way I think it has, it has like a rounded tip. So the way it hits the, the drums and the cymbals isn't as like, um, there's not as much of, what's the word I'm looking for? It's just maybe friction is not the right word. Impact, impact. There's not as much of an impact. Yeah, when you hit when you hit it, so it doesn't break as much. So I go through like one or two sticks a show. Yeah, that seems that seems a little bit more viable there. <laughs> yeah, you mentioned Travis Barker. Is he one of your inspirations? Like, what are some? Who were some of your inspirations growing up? Whether it's you know drumming or any aspect of music. Um, my inspiration for drumming, Travis Barker, is definitely one of my inspirations for drumming. You know, growing up, I used to play a lot of Blink One Eighty Two songs. That was like one of my like go-to and I just love that the energy. I think things with energy, people with energy really inspire me. It doesn't really have to be a drummer. I couldn't tell you like a list of drummers I'm inspired by. It's just more people that possess something I call massive energy, which is like a brand I associate with like my drumming. And I sell like t-shirts too for a little bit that said massive energy. Yeah. People that do stuff or that whatever it is whatever they're passionate about to the point where you feel what they're doing and it affects their own life you know that's that's how i want to play that's how i want to live my life i want people to feel like what i'm doing whatever i'm doing i want them to know i'm giving my 100 percent, and that my action will inspire them in their own life to, to do something yeah, that's really inspiring. And it's that that's a special thing about music that there is an energy transfer there, especially in the live setting. I mean, obviously, oh, yeah. even when you're listening, you know, in your car or whatever it may be, there's a transfer of energy that you get, whether whether that's a, a sad vibe or whether that's something that gets you pumped up, it can make you feel so many different ways. And that's transfer of energy. But Speaking when you're in like a live setting and you're seeing it and you're feeling it and you feel the crowd and, and all that emotion, there's just, it's something that I don't think really anything else in this world can do as far as certain form of art and, and sharing that energy and sharing that feeling, you know, whether it was when they're going through something terrible and then they're pouring their heart out onto a song that everyone gets to hear and that vulnerability and that maybe the worst moment you had is now being shared to so many people that can like feel the same way that you felt which is it's just it is a crazy thing and that's why I love music so much it's just there's nothing quite like it I, I know exactly what you mean I mean especially you know the past couple of years playing at venues in front of like thousands of people it's it's a uh, unbelievable feeling almost so overwhelming of a feeling to interact with that many people at once that really care about what you're doing that it sometimes takes me a long time to process like it, it could take me like a week or even a month to process the emotion that I'm feeling at the time sometimes I, I almost feel numb because it's so much power 
that I need to like sit and like think about what just happened for like a long time. I mean, I can't imagine what it would be like. I mean, you've, like I said earlier, you've played at the big, the venues that people like legendary red rocks. I mean, you know, we can name countless legendary names that have been there, obviously a legendary classic venue. And then, you know, big festivals like Lollapalooza and those kind of places where there's massive amounts of energy. <laughs> like we talk about energy and you feeling energy, which is always all around us. But in those settings, you can really feel it. What was it? I mean, how do you balance that feeling? I mean, I'm sure it's just an eruption of adrenaline. And how, how would you describe that feeling when you're on stage and you just are in front of all those people playing music? Um, Man, it's a it's a very hard feeling to describe. I've I've written like a paragraphs on it in, in my newsletters before, but you know, it's it's like something takes over you and it's like a, a life force just enters into your body and, and takes over. It's a it's a feeling like your skin like you feel your skin tickling, you feel <laughs> like your my heart beating out my chest. I feel the way I describe my focus and you know, it's like the feeling enters my vision and like I have my I just I have bad vision and I've been really stubborn about it recently I, I literally just got my first pair of glasses but I, I don't have good vision but I swear when when I'm up on stage I could see for miles I am so focused because the energy is rushing through me and the emotion and the adrenaline is just spiking it's um it's really an unspeakable emotion I feel it's like like nothing else i mean when i i used to do like uh freestyle skiing and competitive skiing back in the day and i used to get some sorts of the same adrenaline doing stuff like that as well but not as much of the con there's not as much connection with like an audience so just like that feedback loop of emotion of people experiencing different emotions from the music and me feeling that from them and me turning that up in my own system and pushing it back out to them and just that feedback loop is is intense no i can i can only imagine it sounds like you're kind of describing like a flow state though too yes i'm played in front of thousands and thousands of people but i in college or whenever i play uh sports i was i was big into sports so i played in college and and that you would kind of tap into that flow state that adrenaline rush that spike of emotion you can hear and feel the crowd kind of similar type of thing, but um, just it's a, it's a crazy thing when you tap into that flow state and time kind of does stand still. And like you said, your vision, your focus, like you can feel everything. You can feel your heart beat out of your chest and your hair stand up on your arms. And it's just a, it's a crazy feeling when you tap into that. But what I've been trying to do is figure out how to tap into that as much as possible on a daily basis without that excess energy as far as when I say excess energy like people and, and being in front of that those huge crowds because anyone would be able to like feel that emotion at that at that point but the hard part is, is being able to kind of tap into that flow state on a more regular basis um, in, in more everyday life. So is, are there any things that you do? I know that you're into meditation and, and things along those lines. Are there any other practices or things that have helped you kind of quiet, you know, your mind and be able to kind of tap into a, a, a really sincere focus? Yes, there's, there's a lot of things I'm doing and that's, that's what I'm talking about when it comes to my internal growth right now yeah. is about refocusing on the things that that make me tick and make me in that in that flow in that flow state i call it like the deepening of the moment you know what makes me feel like this moment is so deep like every single moment is so deep i i've been feeling you know out of that that moments have been shallow because i've been really busy and i've been focused on a lot of external things in my life whether it's my business or relationships mm -hmm. um which also affect me inside, but I haven't been focusing a lot on things like meditation or writing or developing really nice habits to get in the flow state. I think meditation has a real, a lot of really solid 
um, techniques to bring you back into a flow state. You know, one of the things meditation that I bring into everyday life is when you're meditating and you're focusing, whether it's on, let's just say your breath, you're focusing on your breath and your mind drifts into thought. The whole point is to realize that you're attached to this thought and then bring yourself back to the breath. So I bring that into my own life, whether I'm at, I'm at work, I'm working on something and all of a sudden I start thinking about a million other things. And it's like, wait, let's, let's bring it right back to here. Let's bring it back to this moment, what you're working on right now. So like focusing on one thing at a time has been something I'm, I'm really focusing on and giving it my full attention, you know, bringing my a hundred percent to whatever I'm doing. And that really, that really gets me into the flow state into that timeless moment. Yeah. That's something that I struggle with too, as far as um, being present. Uh, sometimes I find myself drifting like you're, like you're saying, you know, you're working on one thing, your thoughts and mind start drifting, then that affects the present or that affects the person that you're, you're with. You're not fully present with that person um, yeah. in, or you're distracted. And I feel like that's something that a lot of people deal with now, especially when it comes to all the stimulus and the things that are constantly being pushed out of social media, um, crap, whatever you want to call it, your phone, just something that's always, you know, pushing at you, pulling at you, uh, trying to take your attention, trying to take your valuable time. And uh, it's, I always say it's kind of like empty calories, you know, like the the things you put in, just like if you're eating a bunch of bread or white bread and hamburgers and fries, you know, that's, that's the kind of output that you're going to get. You can probably feel lethargic and, you know, you're not going to look that great and then you might not feel that great. And then, you know, just all those things you're eating clean. It's the same way with, you know, the things that you're putting in your mind, positive things is positive output. And that kind of circle of energy that we talked about earlier, um, it is, it is hard though. I feel like a lot of people struggle with it at first and I know I do. And and the biggest thing for me too is consistency. I feel like, cause yes. easy to just like, you know, veer, Oh, I had a bad day today. Oh, I'm a little tired. I'm not going to meditate or, you know, all the excuses that we say to ourselves in our mind when we know we should do something at times, but mm -hmm. how do you kind of combat that? Has this been something that you've been practicing for a while or are you just kind of getting into it? So I've, I've, I've been through lots of phases in my life. Um, I've been, I've been through some phases where I have been almost too much like a monk where I like am way too focused or I am almost like not human. And I've been through other phases where I'm the opposite side where I'm extremely chaotic and not really on any schedule, kind of an anarchy of life. And, you know, I, um, it's, I've been on both. I think that's part of being an artist sometimes is playing around on both sides, but being aware of that at the same time. Um, but right now I'm, I'm really working on finding that great balance in between of being too much like a monk, which I'm not saying monk is a bad thing. I think monks are beautiful, but it's not, I don't want to give up everything. I really enjoy the life I'm living, but I also don't want to be in a place of such chaos and, what I think is the determining factor of, of the balance is time and knowing that you're not going to be a master today. You know, it's about putting in every day, you know, the consistency that we're talking about and being easy on yourself when you feel like it's, you can't do it or you didn't have the time to do it that day. Because if you stress yourself out more about what you're trying to achieve, it's just going to create so much anxiety and you're never going to get to it. So it, when it comes to meditation, like I want to, like the, the Gavin I aspire to be wants to meditate like 30 minutes a day, but sometimes I just don't have that time. So if, if I can get a minute in, you know, that's all that, that's all that matters. You know, I'm going to be easy on myself. I'm not going to kill myself about trying to, trying to be that perfect person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I feel like oftentimes, for high achievers also, you know, we get into that constant state of being hard on ourselves and, and thinking about the future too much. And, and that's something that's good to do. You know, it's good to plan ahead, write five-year goals, write 10-year goals where, you know, not even just financially like relationships and, and self-development, self-growth, like you've been diving into lately. But at the same time, it's like, okay, those are my goals, but realize that it is a day to day. Like, yeah. 
I can't get to where I want to be five years from now if I don't do what I'm supposed to do today and focus on today and be fully present and giving, you know, all that I have to today. Because at the end of the day, you know, I could set a goal for five years from now and I may not make it there. You know? Exactly. So exactly. You used to beat yourself up over, you know, one, one thing or two things, which I, I, I fall victim to sometimes. And a lot of other people do as well. I beat myself up every day over, over things. It's, it's takes time. You know, it, it, it's really what I've learned in everything in life. The biggest lesson is everything will take longer than you think it will. And, and you know, whether I feel like a really easy way is for people who, you know, people who work out, you know, you're not going to be extremely jacked one day after working out, you know, it takes a long time uh, to, to build the muscle mass that you're looking for. It it takes years, you know, and the same thing with anything that you want to do in life. And, you know, if you want to start a musical instrument, you're not going to be great at it tomorrow. It's going to take a long time until you get there. So it's the same thing with anything you want to do in your life. It's just putting in that a little bit every day to eventually you're going to get to a day and it's going to, it's going to be that great day where you're really good at it. Yeah. And you're not going to notice it. You're not because like, it's so hard to realize the progress you're making in the moment. You know, that's why, you know, reflection is also really important. It's really important. You know, for me at the end of my day, I write down three things I loved about today because we, we can get really lost in just the movement of days. Yeah. And all of a sudden it's, you're going to sleep and it's the next day. You're going to sleep and it's the next day. You're not thinking about, even if like you had a really amazing coffee and that was the only thing that was great about your day, you know, that was, it's a great thing, you know, just embrace that, the reflection of that. And then you can reflect on your month, you know, you can reflect on like the past couple of years of your life. And even if you're not in a place that you want to be, you know, you can reflect back and think about times that, that you did enjoy and then aspire that for your future. You know, it's, it's a really important piece for growth. Yeah. And you talked about that, you know, realizing that it's, it's not going to happen overnight kind of thing. But I think, I think that's when you can kind of find and realize that you are doing something that is part of your purpose or your passion. You know, I feel like everyone's searching for that passion or that purpose, Mm -hmm. but, and they're like, Oh, this may be cool. I'm going to try this. And then things don't go their way or, you know, people shoot them down or they fail a few times and it's like, Oh, maybe I don't want to do this. But you know you found your passion or your purpose whenever it's something that you have like an unrelentless energy towards. And, and there's no one that can tell you no in regards to, you know, following your heart, following your gut and your feeling. That's something that I feel like we're all looking for that purpose or passion or, or whatever it may be. But to me recently, that's been something that's like very, very big on my mind. One, like not being afraid of failure. Because knowing that, you know, at, on the backside of failure is going to be success. Like failure is just one step in front of success. If you try to ride a bike at first, you fall off and you bust your ass a couple of times. Okay, guess what's on the other side? Okay, you learn to not, you know, tilt your body too much to the left and center yourself a little more. So you're just like eliminating steps before you get to where you want to be. So that's it. And that's a weird way to look at it for some people, but I think you have to embrace and love failing because you know, you're always going to, you know, it's, it's a constant struggle and, and your goals are, even if you're good at something, you're going to fail. And like you said, like Jimi Hendrix didn't just pick up the guitar and start shredding like he does. Like he wasn't a legend at birth. Like, yeah, he may have been very musically inclined or talented, but he still had to learn a G chord, learn a C chord, just like everybody else that picked up guitar has to do. So I think that's something that's important for us to keep in mind, which a lot of times the simple things are hard to implement and remember. hundred percent. You know, we, we make life so complicated as humans. We try and make it as complicated as possible to almost distract us from the fact that life is not as complicated as we think it is. And it's really, when you get to the root of everything, uh, everything that's on your mind, it's really, really simple. Um, I, I went to this meditation retreat once and I was like, how do I like sit still for, <laughs> for 45 minutes? Like I can't do it. And literally the meditation teacher was like, sit still, you know, it's that simple. It's, 
we we make things so complicated we come up with all these reasons of why we can't do something when really it's just just sit still and and that is really hard to do though it's it's extremely challenging to do just because it's simple doesn't mean it's it's not hard right that is that is so true just sit still man that is that's good i like that a lot Uh, Speaking of which, like sitting still and even just focusing, how, how have you been able to focus and like rechannel your energy during quarantine in this, in this weird time for creators and, and definitely musicians? You know, that live aspect and being on the road is such a huge part of what y'all do. So how have you been able to kind of uh, refocus and like rechannel your energy to the situation that we're in right now? Um, I mean, I definitely have my hard days, you know, ever like, I'm not like, I'm not superhuman whatsoever. Um, like I definitely have really hard days where I'm so shook by anxiety that I can't, you know, focus on anything, but just like sitting there. And I, th- I feel like a lot of people are going through that. And, you know, I don't even know where it comes from. Sometimes it's all, all of a sudden, it just bombards me with just like, every corner of my life just being just hitting me you know, you know the weight of the world right now you know what's what's happening in our own country you know what's happening in my own life it's like the layers and it hits you um but with that too you know it's just it's just time you know and writing really really helps me but what refocuses me and what what keeps me focused is you know i give myself time to not just do the work that I need to do, but like, look at how I'm going to do that work and how I'm going to live day to day. And this is something I feel a little bit lucky that I've had a lot of experience um, experimenting with how I structure my day because I've never really had, um, I've had a couple, you know, nine to five jobs, but most most of my life I've been lucky to able to experience a free form um, style of life where I get to choose how what time I wake up what I do when I wake up what I do in the middle of my day and what I do at the end of my day and and then looking at at the week and I think that's that's really really helped me especially in quarantine is is structuring my my time looking at the the morning like what do I want to do in the morning when do I want to do my work how do I want to do my work what am I doing in the evening and being proactive about it and even though I there there are hard days they, they come, it just allows me to focus more on, on what I need to do when I kind of have an idea of the life that, that I'm living right now. Cause there's no, there's no real structure to it right now. And I feel like that's really hard for some people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Structure. A lot of people I think obviously are realizing now, and, and I know what you're saying about, you know, feeling anxious about the times. And I know a lot of people are, are right there with you. It's tough times that we're in at this point for a lot of people. So, um, but it's, it's all about perspective too, you know, and, and I think that you've taken a good, a good take on it using this time and saying, okay, this situation, I can't really control it, but what I can control is how I attack this and how I think about it. So you, for instance, have learned how to structure your days to, to make it, you know, work for you the best. How, how have been some of the things like what's, what's kind of been the structuring, how, how the mornings go? Are there anything that you've been kind of doing that's been working and helping you? Um, so I would say what is really helpful, but not might be helpful for others is I have a really amazing team around me, like my business partners, I've been, you know, they're really motivating because they're all the same as me and like to get things done every day. But I think what helps me every day is, you know, the, the classic thing of having some kind of a morning routine. You know, something that makes you excited to get into your day, you know, when you wake up in the morning that you're not just like, oh, another day, you know, like, what do you, what do you like to do in the morning? What motivates you to get up in the morning? And, you know, whether you have to work or you don't have to work, you know, like what is going to motivate you to focus on whatever you're trying to accomplish? Right. Yeah. I think that's huge. And, and that's the, that is a big thing. It's the first win, the first win of the day, you know, getting out of bed and setting your intentions correctly and, and, and not rolling over on the alarm clock. And those things are really small habits that you create 
But I mean, I can tell you from personal experience, I feel the biggest difference when I hit the snooze button or when I pop right up or, or when I don't, you know, take time in the morning to have gratitude for just being alive, having another day. Like you said, the smallest things, oh, my cup of coffee was great today. You know, you can exactly. say thanks that I, you know, have this shirt, have a roof over my head or that I have some food to eat or, you know, it, whatever small thing it may be or big thing. It's kind of just like bringing yourself back to reality that, hey, I'm here. This is another day. This is another opportunity, a blessing. But I mean, that's, that's, that's habits that we create. That's habits that we create with our thinking and with our actions. And yeah. like a lot, oftentimes we think of habits as things that we're like actively doing. But so much, I mean, 70, 80% of, of life happens, you know, inside of your head first uh, before it ever is projected on anybody else or before you project, you know, your actions. So I would, I would say all of life is, is in your head. Yeah. Everything in life is in your head. You know, your, your projection of the world, how you see the world really creates your, your reality. Mm-hmm. It really does. You know, if you, if you're, a, if you're thinking, you know, positive about your day, you know, you're more likely to set yourself up to have a positive day. You're going to have a confirmation bias that, you're like, oh, today's going to be great. You're going to want to confirm that in everything that you do in the day. When you when something happens that is positive, you're going to be like, you're going to be like, oh, it's because like I'm having a good day. Whether if you have the the opposite kind of mindset where it's like everything's shitty, like nothing's going to go my way, you're you're setting yourself up for that. You you really are. Yeah. Um, and I guess um, some things I, I I do that to start my day is I wake up, I try like this is a guideline too. like, it's really important to, like I said before, don't be too hard on yourself. Don't be so strict because you're human. You're not a robot. You're not meant to reproduce the same procedures at the same exact minute every day. You know, sometimes it's going to change, but my, my ideal morning to get me ready for, for my day is I wake up and I meditate for 15 to 20 minutes. And then I do a little like recap of my meditation and how it felt. You know, I'll write that down a couple sentences. I'll write down 10 things I'm grateful for. And then, and that can be anything that can range from, you know, I'm just grateful for the sun. You know, I'm grateful to have woken up this morning, you know, to like, I'm grateful for my family. I don't need to have like super intense things you're grateful for. You know, it's, you don't have to, it's not that hard. I just try and let my pen flow. Mm-hmm. It's like whatever comes out at the end of I'm grateful for, or I'm grateful to be, whatever comes out. And then I set three intentions for my day. It's like, I want to be like today. I, I want to be patient. You know, I want to be, I don't want to feel, you know, mad at anyone for like stupid reasons. I want to listen to what people are saying fully. Like that, that was one of my intentions today. I want to do things one at a time, even though it might be slower I want to be able to really give my hundred percent to everything I'm doing today. And, you know, I want to, you know, go on a run, you know, those are be my three intentions I set for the day. Yeah. Um, and then I'll go off to my day or, you know, wherever it takes me, you know, it's an adventure. Every day is an adventure. And it's actually really fun to look at it that way. Cause you never know like what is going to happen throughout your day and the variables that are going to come up and, whether they're sad or happy, it's, it's an adventure. You know, there's always the, the downfalls and the, the big climax and in, in every story. And if you look at your life that way, it could be, you know, even though, it, even though in, there's, there are sad things that happen in the day, it, it still makes it an adventure and something to look forward to and find purpose in, in your moments. Mm, yeah, I love that. You talked, uh, you talked a lot about earlier, you know, you know, being, being a part of like nature and like being outside. And, and I can tell that you, you kind of really connect with that. And I'm, I'm the same way. I love being outside. And as far as like energy goes and, and, uh, you know, feeling like part of earth and part of nature. And that just does something for me that not much can, uh, you talked about hiking and, and doing those things. And that's just being out and being a part of nature, being in, in the water is like one of my favorite things ever. And I heard this concept not too long ago, um, by Ben Greenfield. You probably, you may have heard of him. 
Yeah, I've heard of Ben Griffo, yeah. He's like basically used himself for everyone who hasn't heard of him. He basically like uses himself as a lab rat for like biohacking and all of these different things like microdosing psilocybin and, and then certain types of eating and all of these different ways to exercise. And he was talking about grounding as far as like feeling like the feeling like the earth on your feet or swimming in like a natural river or, or whatever it may be. And just like the energy transfer that happens whenever you do those things. Do you, do you feel a similar way as far as like being out in nature breathing fresh air, uh, whatever it may be as far as like being a part of nature and like kind of having yourself feel small, but also at the same time feel part of something. I feel extremely connected to nature, especially for me. It's, it's the woods and, and the mountains. Yeah. When, when, I'm, when I'm in the woods and in the mountains, I feel, you know, an extreme sense of, of recharge, you know, and it's been funny. I've been talking with a lot of people recently about how imitating, you know, the, our, the nature around us can really help us in our own life. I'm, I'm reading this book right now, wherever you go, there you are. And he's talking, one of the things he talks about is the author, uh, John Kabat-Zinn. He talks about the mountains and how when you're meditating, you know, be like the mountain, you know, the weather, you know, it's good weather or bad weather the mountain stays still. And so in your own life, you know, re replicate the mountain and in the, the weather of your life, whether it's a stormy day or a sunny day, metaphorically, yeah. you know, how can, how can you be aware in that moment and bring, you know, stillness to those moments? And, you know, I think about that all the time, you know, I look at the trees and, you know, how, beautiful they are yet and chaotic yet perfect yeah. you know it's the same thing with humans you know we we are beautiful we are definitely chaotic yeah but we're perfect in our, in our own ways and each each one of us is that way you know we're all different we're all we're all perfect and we're, we're all chaotic yeah and uh that. You know, i see i see that all through all through nature and you know i i would say trying to tame it too much is just as bad as letting loose too much. I think like we're talking about balance. You yeah. know, there's, there's a, ba there's a balance in nature too, you know? And yeah, it's when, when I'm out, when I'm out in nature, I really, I really feel that a lot. Yeah. I feel like that's been a, a positive, a plus of quarantine for me um, being able to be like, well, there, I mean, there is nothing else really at that at early on there really was nothing else that was open and and that being outside is always something i would rather gravitate towards but i think for a lot of people it really kind of like pushed them out like okay well this is this is what you know go on a hike instead of doing whatever else you usually do that's not being outside that is in front of a screen or uh you know being able to unplug and get out and just be a part of like nature or be a part of, you know, whatever it may be that you're doing at that time. Uh, I went on a river trip. There's a beautiful river in Arkansas called uh, the Buffalo River. It had, like big mountains. It's like a lot of rolling hills here in Arkansas. And I know in Connecticut where you're from, it's really pretty, really pretty countryside as well. I wish it would stay warmer more. <laughs> yeah, I know. You're very pretty. Every time I go up there, it's, it's very gorgeous up there. But um, I remember I just, we stayed in a little cabin, no phone service. And it was the most refreshing thing ever to be able to just, you know, drop off the map per se and not feel like you have something that's constantly, you know, pulling your attention. It's just so refreshing and, and so, you know, recharging, like you said, it, it really did feel like I was physically recharging, uh, just being, being a part of that. And definitely strongly suggest anyone who doesn't do it to, to kind of implement that be, be intentional on implementing that in your life. I agree. I a hundred percent agree. And like, even, you know, going camping for like a, a day and a night, it really like resets you, you know, we, we're, uh, we are, we, there's, we are surrounded by light all the time. We have light all night and it really like, it really messes us up in a way that we don't know. 
And it's really crazy how when you, when you go into the woods and you go camping, you fall asleep once, once the sun goes down, it's dark and you wake up with the sun and you get on this like beautiful cycle with nature and you feel so refreshed. We are dark deprived, you know, we, we don't really get dark, especially in the city where I'm from in New York. It's, it's like, I don't go, I don't really go to the bed until like way too late, you know, one, two AM every night. And I'm yeah. trying to get up early in the morning still. And it's definitely, you know, it's, it's tough. Yeah. There, that circadian rhythm is, is a, is a crazy thing. Like your body naturally waking up at a certain time, but that's also uh, when it goes back to habits, as far as, you know, waking up at a certain time, trying to go to bed and wake up within a specific, you know, within like a couple of hours, maybe an hour of each other, uh, whatever that may be for each person is, is unique to them. But that really does help your body get on a cycle and, and per, have you be in REM sleep longer so that, you know, you recover better, you know, you, you feel better, you don't feel groggy. Uh, I feel like a lot of people have trouble with sleep. And I mean, we all do at times, but um, like ultraviolet light from your phone and stuff like that late at night is really disruptive to your sleeping patterns and causes a lot of issues when it comes to that, which I mean, I'm guilty of it all the time. Be looking at my phone right before I go to bed. Oh yeah, me too. <laughs> for you. And for when you wake up in the morning looking at it, I mean, it's just, it actually is a little bit better for you to like wake, waking up. Um, not that you should start the day by looking at your phone, but by any means, but at night it's actually really detrimental to sleep. It'd yeah, be I'm, I, really good to like of, an hour. Yeah. Bed. Um, one one of the habits I'm really trying to kick is is phone usage. You know, it's like I definitely find myself being way too attached to my phone. You know, looking at it like like you said, right in the morning when I wake up, or like right before I go to bed, or throughout the day. You know, you just find yourself just just on the phone, just like losing like those empty calories you know you're saying it's losing time really and yeah you know it really takes you out of the moment and you know you it takes a long time i feel like to even get back into the moment that you were doing because there's so much stimulus in the phone and it sucks for me because a lot of a lot of what i do I, you know, i'm always texting you know with different artists i'm texting my teammates um i'm going on instagram to like see to kind of like do research and see what other artists are doing see what I can implement with like the artists I work with and or even implement with myself or see cool things and it can really you can really find yourself astray and making excuses for why you're why, why, why you're on it I'm really trying to just kick that habit it's, it's it's so hard I mean it is the day and age that we're in and it's I mean it is essential kind of essential to life right now I mean especially with business and you know even the podcast or doing what you do as well. Like it's essential to, and it is the way of life for us now, but just being able to detox from it, being able to put it down and say, okay, whether you do it for an hour a day or whatever, an hour before bed or whatever it may be like, okay, this is my time to be present. Like I always, uh, we always had a rule at our house. It was like no phones at dinner or whatever, you know, just like that was a time to sit down with the family and like be present with them. How was your day? Like talk about those kind of things, have those conversations. Um, just, you know, living in the moment kind of thing. You were talking about some of your artists, uh, who, like, who are some of the guys that are coming up right now, uh, on the label? So we just started the label. I mean, I guess I'll give you like a little backstory. I come from, you know, I started a management company called Baron Owl about four years ago. And one of, one of our major goals as a company was to eventually start a label. Um, so we've done, on our management side, we've done all of our clients. We basically acted as their label. We distributed all their music. Yeah. And we have a, our catalog has over 200 million streams across the roster. Wow. And we, this past, the last summer in 2019, we like made a deck of like all, all the amazing things we've done with our with our artists and we sent it around and the orchard, which is a distri awesome distribution company invested like a large, a large amount of money into us to start our own label, which is now pack records. And it was a blessing because literally right when quarantine hit the week after we signed, signed the deal with them. And it was a really amazing thing to like work on during quarantine because i yeah you know, i wasn't touring anymore i was i was on tour um 
right before quarantine hit, um, well, right when coronavirus hit, I had to fly home from, from Minneapolis, Minnesota. And we launched the label in May. Right now we have a couple artists. One, our first release was Yukio, who is one of our management clients. And he's from Australia. Um, he's an amazing electronic producer. He's coming out with an album um, later this year. And then we launched a new project named Will Hyde who is another one of our management clients as well, who was part of uh, electronic duo. And then he switched like when they broke up, he pretty much took two years of like voice lessons and figuring out who he is. And now he's this amazing solo act just as Will Hyde. And we're launching his, um, his whole new project right now. And it's doing really well. And we just released an album by this Canadian singer, Nala Blues. And we have a, this other great artist, Godford. We, we're basically signing all these different artists from different genres from around the world. Love that. And it's been really exciting for me because I get to be the guy who goes out and finds all the talent and talks to all these artists around the world and hears these amazing stories of, of why they got into art. And it's been extremely motivating for me uh, during this time. Yeah, I'm sure not only is it cool, but it also is, like you said, motivating to to yeah. be able to like hear their story, feel their vibe, see what they're doing with their music, and then being able to like almost implement that uh, kind of the same way with your music and and what you're doing. How did uh, how did you and Chelsea meet and like link up and eventually go on tour together? Um, so one of actually one of my business partners, um, Theo, was interning at Chelsea's management company um, and they were looking for a sub for her drummer Yeah. at the time. And he hit me up. He's like, dude, Gavin, like they're looking for a sub for, for Chelsea's drummer for like a week of, of shows. Like, do you want to do it? Like I'll tell him you want to do it. And I was working a nine to five job while having the side hustle of the management company at the time. And I was like, sure, I'll take, I'll take a week off vacation, a week vacation and I'll go on tour. <laughs> and so I did that one time and then it happened again a month later where they needed me again. And then literally a day before Chelsea left for her first sold out tour, her drummer dropped out and they, they called me and they're like, Gavin, like you're the only one who knows the parts. Like, can you like, come on tour like to, like pretty much tomorrow it was like i think it was like two days and i i like committed and i quit i literally quit my job that day and and left and that, that the rest is history that is so cool and i mean right right as she was just blowing up selling out these major venues so you kind of were yeah. thrown into the ringer there yeah. And I mean, it was something I've always wanted to do. I've always played in bands growing up and drumming has been like, it's been like a huge, huge passion for me, but really under the radar. Most people, they knew I drummed, but didn't know how much I love drums and how much it was a dream of mine to, you know, be a rock star. And uh, it's been really great the past couple of years being able to fulfill that dream um, because it was something I never thought I would do. and. I'm, I'm extremely grateful for the experience and, you know, all the people I've met, like, you know, like we we're talking about Cam, you know, before we got started talking on the podcast and you know, Cam is like a, a brother to me. And it's like, we met before we were born or something. It's like we met and we immediately knew like we were going to be friends. Yeah. That's sick. There, there is a, there's a cool energy and vibe and feel when you meet a person like that, that you just mesh with, whether it's same sex or opposite sex. I mean, you just kind of know early on, it's like, well, this person and me kind of just click and work. And that's, it's funny how that works out. I have a lot of people like that in my life where that energy that you have when you're with that person, you know, we're talking about energy a lot, but literally everything is energy and, and yeah. it's good or bad. So it's, it, I definitely know what you're talking about. I definitely know. Did you, so when you like got the part and you're like, okay, or even when you were subbing early on, how long did it take you? Cause I'm sure it was a quick, Hey, can you sub? How long did it take you to kind of learn the set, learn the parts? Do they like send you the sheet music or like, how does that work? Um, pretty much like I had a, she sent me the songs and I have to listen to the songs and make up my own drum parts. 
And that was, it was really challenging. You know, it was my first time really doing this. And I, every night I'd pretty much get home from work and sit down at my drum kit and just memorize and rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. You know, it's that consistency huh. at an extreme scale of, you know, I think I had a week and a half of practice before the, the first round of shows to really lock in everything. That's, that's crazy. So they just sent you a set list. You're listening to these songs on repeat and just mm. kind of playing and get, catching. Wow, that's cool. Does it always work like that? Or is there times where the artist may want a specific way for it to be played? It starts like that. And then you get, so I learn the parts and then me and Chelsea and now JT, who's our keyboardist, will get in the studio and we pretty much like present almost like, We'll play with the music, like this is what we came up with. And Chelsea and the music director will, be, will give us notes on what we should change, what we should update, like we'll play too loud there, play too soft there. It'd be sick if you did this fill instead of that fill. And yeah. you kind of lock it in like in the last couple of days before the tour. Yeah, no, that's sick. Does Chelsea and JT, do they live out there in New York as well? Um, they, they used to. Um, I think Chelsea is still, Chelsea still has her apartment here, but yeah. I don't know if she's renewing her lease and JT uh, and his girlfriend, they've just moved out of New York and they're staying at their parents in Connecticut. Yeah. I think they, I think they're figuring out what their next move is going to be, yeah. but um, we're, we're all from the same town, which is, which is also really funny. <laughs> crazy. That's crazy. Yeah. Like so, I mean, I've heard of a lot of people moving out of, of the city and, and tr- kind of just going back whether it's Connecticut or the surrounding areas or home, wherever home may be. It's just crazy times. Have, how have y'all been, uh, you know, kind of like staying connected and keeping, keeping the music going? Have y'all been doing any like virtual sets or is there anything that you've been doing kind of unique to keep that going? Um, we've, I've seen them a couple of times. We, me and JT went up to record upstate for a day with, with Chelsea um, on some new music that she's working on. And that was a really cool experience. Um, they like rented like this, this like a uh, recording studio compound upstate um, New York. And we, I got to throw on some, some drum parts and JT did some keys. So we've got to play some music together, which has been cool, but we've hung out a couple of times. But besides that, there's not much that we can do right now, um, which has been tough. You know, I love playing music and, I haven't been able to really express myself in that way as much. Yeah. What's like we talked about earlier. I mean, that intense adrenaline and feel that you get and, and obviously um, just, you know, pretty irreplaceable when it comes to that. But how have you been able to kind of almost center yourself from being on such an extreme high when you're on tour and living that lifestyle and then, you know, coming back home and being obviously being a lot more, you know, chill or however you may explain it uh different vibe obviously totally so how have you been able to kind of like bring yourself to a place where you know it isn't such a high high and such a low low yeah i mean obviously after right when tour ends i always have a couple days or it could be a week of really low lows it's, you know post tour blues is a real thing that but i've got i've gotten better at it and have systems of getting out of it whether it's just turning off for a week or whatnot. But I think what it really comes down to is being adaptable. Um, It's something that I've really learned is how to adapt to every situation and how to find, you know, the feelings you're looking for in every day, you know? So I find extreme adrenaline when I'm working out or like running more miles than I ever have, you know, finding, pushing myself to limits in different ways yeah. I'm able to get those same feelings. You know, I think you always, if, if you can look at your life, you know, if you, if you really step out and figure, you can always figure out ways to get feelings you're looking for or accomplish things that you want to be doing. It's just, it's just about taking the time to do so and adapting. And I'm luckily I'm very easily amused, very, easily like i'm happy wherever i am always like you can put me wherever i'll, I'll find a paper clip and play with it for hours you know i really doesn't take much for me to be happy and and settled in where i am um i think that also a mindset like that you know takes time to to develop as well and 
being being open minded and I think is one of the most badass things a human can do. Um, you know, everyone's close close minded a lot of times and stuck in their ways and will defend, you know, what they what they believe in or where they are and find especially where they find comfort. But to be open to new experiences and ones that you know, aren't as beneficial for you. You know, the quarantine hasn't been great for, for anyone really. You know, it's been a real different style of life and, you know, it's not normal. But being able to adapt and to find happiness or to find feelings of adrenaline and push yourself in new ways, you know, to experiment and play around with your reality and your existence, you know, it's, it, I think it's doable for, for anyone in any situation. Yeah. I'm sure you have a bunch of crazy stories, but what's one that just comes to mind when it comes to tour life, whatever it may be. <laughs> um, one that comes to mind, I was actually my, my, uh, our tour manager, Manny, he actually just dropped off my drum set from tour yeah. yesterday at my apartment. We got drinks and one time when our bus broke down oh. and uh, we were in this town called Wairico, which is on the border of Oregon and California. Yeah. And we were stuck in, we were in like a junkyard. Our bus was in a junkyard for like two days. We were there and then a mi we got picked up in a minivan. <laughs> we had to get down to San Francisco. We played a show in San Francisco and then went to, right to bed, woke up the next day because we had to get to LA and we hopped in another minivan and we went to get breakfast and we put our name down for a reservation at this diner and we came back outside just to wait and our car was robbed. Like our car, someone broke into our car, like smashed the window, stole everything from, from our car. It was like my, all of our computers, like our, the, our photographer Jonah, all of his photography gear, the lighting guy, his lighting computer, and like a lot of other really valuable like personal possessions, like a, like my drum pad I've had since I was like, uh, since I started drumming was in there. Uh, everyone lost a lot of really valuable stuff. And so that really sucked. And I, like, I don't know how to like, I've never been robbed and I just, I know I don't trust like my stuff anywhere, which has been a bummer. But then we, we dropped that minivan off, get a new minivan and we're making our way down to LA and a tire rolls into the middle of the highway. We go over it. We, we're in the middle of the desert now. And we have a, a flat tire. And we can't call an Uber at all. And this is the same day. God. Y'all have... And, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It really felt that way. Finally, a police officer drove by. And somehow he was able to call us an Uber. And me... And we had split up in, there were six of us in this minivan. Me, JT, and Jonah hopped in the first Uber that got there. And our Uber driver ended up being an absolute nut, was driving 120 miles per hour on the highway, telling us how he's running for president on the stance that he wants to eliminate um, carpool lanes on highways. And he's, he's going, he's weaving through cars at going 120 miles per hour saying, see how safe I could drive. If, if everyone just drove like this, we can all like be safe and there'd be no, no traffic. And yeah, it was, that was the crazy, one of the craziest days of my life. <laughs> Sounds like he was on some drugs to me. Like yeah. president blasting 120 in the Uber. Yeah. I would have, I would have been pretty scared there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was, um, wild day right there oh the computer had to suck losing your computer especially as an artist and camera oh my goodness yeah everyone lost like you know i lost like a lot of you know everyone has their photos and memories on their computers and yeah you know our i feel bad for our photographer for jonah you know he had years of you know his photos and videos that he's taken archived and it's all it's all gone you know oh so, Man, some people just, that's tough. That's so tough. But I mean, you made it, you made it, you may have barely, you may have barely made it, but that's one yeah. of the, don't forget. And you can look back and laugh at now. That was not funny at all in the moment, but man, that's crazy. Well, man, we've had such a good conversation. Uh, what, this is a question I love to ask. What is your definition of success? 
Whoa. My definition of success. I think that for me that changes so often. Yeah. Um, really depending on what my goals are. But I would say my definition of success is, you know, at the end of my life, not even. Wow, this is such a hard question for me to answer. Cause this is why I love asking this question. And what you're doing now is what majority, 99% of the people do. They're like, man. I never thought about that. And I, I never really did either until I heard it asked. And I was like, what is, what is success? To me? Like, how do I, hmm. how do I, I think in the words, I think is, you know, as, as humans, I, I read this book that called the, the denial of death. And it basically says that humans are part half spirit, half animal and our spirits out of us you know, we, as humans, we have, we're conscious and because of our consciousness, we have unlimited potential. Whatever we set our minds to, we could probably go and do it great to some extent. And the other half, we're animal. We're, we're in a finite body. Our body is going to, you know, one day not be on this earth. And what gives us the most anxiety is trying to fit an unlimited amount of infinite potential into a finite period. So I think success for me is, you know, building something, building something of meaning, something that has meaning for the world, not just for me, that can live on beyond me, something that continues to fulfill this infinite potential that I had while living here that benefits the rest of the world in some way. Wow, I love that. And that made me think of, um, this con the concept and the idea that there is unlimited, like you said, unlimited potential, like there is no shortage of success in this world. Like there is no, it's not a resource that is going to run out. Uh, there's no, Oh, this, these many people have done this, so I can't, or, you know, this market's too saturated or there's too many drummers or too many podcasts or whatever it may be. If you have something that you want to do and you're passionate about it, there is, and you, and you put action. I, I truly believe that. And I think that you have to believe that in order to achieve those things, there is no, you know, no finite way to describe it other than you can acquire whatever you believe you can acquire if you put your percent back in. So that's a, I mean, that's a great concept. That's one that I try and remind myself constantly because I feel like we do sometimes get into the mode, especially with com comparison and things along those lines. Like, oh, I don't, I can't, I can't do it as good as he did or, or whatever. But like we talked about, you know, Jimi Hendrix picked up a guitar at, at one point for the first time. So, yeah, never, never compare yourself to anybody. You just gotta, you just gotta do what you want to do and, you know, do it in your own way. And, you know, through practice and repetition, you, you will come out, you know, your essence will come out in whatever you're doing and people will see that. Yeah. I think we care too much sometimes about what other people think. And, and I, oh, yeah. I, I, I ride the line of, do I care at all about what other people think or do I care too much? And, and I think there's, there's a middle ground that you have to kind of feel out, but I think definitely it's weighing towards the not caring as much what people think because the other people are never going to satisfy you, you know, and, and that's even in a relationship too, you can't rely on, on one person to satisfy you. Like oh, yeah. to be something more, uh, there has to be a bigger purpose or a bigger piece. And that's for me, that's where the spiritual side of my life comes in and my, and my beliefs, you know, and my religion and things like that. Um, because it, at the end of the day, it's like, I can't put so much pressure for you X person, whoever it may be to give me happiness. And I think that's why there is, you know, divorce and so much divorce and things like along those natures and relationships that fail because we put too much into other people as far as relying on them for our happiness when it really starts inside of us and then being able to project that to other people. Yeah, I, 
I agree a hundred percent. I mean, like, I feel, I feel like I have the same exact mindset on relationships. Like you, it's like, you have to bring your own happiness. You have to find your happiness within and the other person has to bring their happiness within and what you, your relationship is in the middle of that. You know, you're building something in the middle there. You both bring your happiness to, to come together, to create this, that beautiful happiness that that relationship has. Yeah. I'm like seeing a mental image in my head when you're saying that of like two people and like walking upstairs and like meeting at the top, right? It's exactly helping each other and like elevating each other because you said earlier, we're all imperfect humans though. How can we put our a hundred percent faith and trust into an imperfect human who's going to fail and going to have things that go wrong and, and they're going to let us down when, when, you know, but if you have that solid foundation and core, uh, of beliefs and and that just goes back to me always it wraps around to the physical mental and spiritual and the, all of those working together um but and it is it is it is a beautiful thing it is a beautiful thing this this world we live in and music it reminds me of uh you i'm sure you've seen it the what is it the tiny desk concerts is that what they're yeah and matt when mac miller did it, it's the best one to me my favorite by far but he's like Music is a beautiful thing. Music is a beautiful thing, isn't it? Because he, uh, he had three girls come on, never played a set with them before, kind of similar to what you were talking about, a really short period of time. They literally did a rehearsal for 2009, uh, the song where he, they had the strings, and these three girls come on and play it for the first time together, all together, and it just seems like they had been playing it together for like the last 10 years. Like it was flawless and so beautiful, but... It's just music, right? Music is a beautiful thing. That's what he said. It's so beautiful. You know, there's a, one of my favorite quotes is that art decorates space and music decorates time. Mm. Yeah, that is, that's incredible. Well, Gavin, is there, how can people find and learn more about you? What's your Instagram handle? Tell them where they can find you, reach out. All those good. Um, you can find me, my Instagram handle is at Gavin Chops. And um, I have a I have a link in my bio there, you know, classic link in bio. So <laughs> you can to sign up for my um, weekly chop, which I haven't put out in a while because I've been growing and collecting my thoughts, and now I'm ready to start writing again. I'm actually going to put my first one out again tonight. So I'm going be ready. I was yeah, I was checking it out. I'm definitely gonna go do that as soon as we're done here because I love I love to be able to you know get knowledge from other people who have similar mindsets and thoughts. And, and I think that's huge to surround yourself with people who do pour into you, aren't giving you those empty calories who are giving you substance and, and worth and, and growth to your life. So y'all definitely go and subscribe to that because it's just weekly motivation, right? What all is on there? Like, what can they expect? Um, so I have, it's called like a, a massive energy minute. So it's just like a little tidbit of information that you can apply into your own life. I also put my five favorite songs of the week and then a quote from, from someone influential or something that I'm reading. So just, it's like a, it's like a nice little bundle of of good information. Yeah. That's super fresh, super quick and and a good way to start a Monday. It sounds like to me. So y'all definitely go check that out. And, and Gavin, thank you so much for coming on, man. It's been a pleasure. And, Look forward to keeping in touch in the future. And th- thanks for having me. This has been really special. You know, I'm, I feel in, extremely inspired and you know, t- I have that energy that we've been talking about you know, this whole time and can't wait to meet you in person. No, oh, yeah, absolutely. I'm going to go for I'm, I feel the same way. I'm about to like go for a run here. <laughs> right, y'all, thank you so much for joining us again. As always, go follow us on Instagram at Breathing Air Podcast. We're on Apple Spotify, iHeartRadio, if you're listening, you know the deal. But if you enjoyed Gavin and you enjoyed the podcast, share it with a friend, as always. And if you could go comment and rate on Apple Podcasts, that always helps move us along. So thank you so much. Have a great rest of your week. Boom. Cool, man. That was awesome. Dude, that was great.